Alrighty, g'day guys and welcome to episode 31 of the Bradley J Driver Experience. Of course, it's your pilot, the host, Bradley Driver behind the mic here today. And we've got a very special guest riding shotgun. This man is very well known in the Wollongong area, but also very well known in the photography community. We're just shy of 180,000 followers on Instagram. He takes some unbelievable, unbelievable shots of the ocean and Mother Nature at its best. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Warren Keelan, how are you, brother? I'm great, mate. Thanks for having me on board. Mate, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. It's, we just had a really good, for everyone listening and watching, we just had a really good probably hour or so yarn just before we kick this off. And I said to Warren, one of the things that I really like about him as a human being is his decency as well as how great he is <laughs> at, at his heart. And we probably, I knew, I knew of Warren for a while. He's got a shop just here in Wollongong, as well as some great social presence. So I recognise the face, but we met for the first time just a week ago now in the car park at North Beach, Wollongong, where I was literally running across to get my tower to jump in the ocean after a coffee. And I seen this lad in a wetsuit throwing his board back in the van and I said, G'day mate, what's the temp in there like? And just turned into a great conversation and a good little yarn over a coffee. So... It's always a good, um, always a good indication to see the decency of a human being in those first moments you meet. So thanks, mate. That's really nice for you to say. Yeah, it was great. I, I'd, I'd recognised your your face and um, from what I'd seen the socials and Facebook, etc. And uh, uh, yeah, I just saw you. Fa- I was just kind of, hey, mate, had to say good day to you. Yeah. I just got out of the water. I was in the water for a couple of hours shooting sunrise. So it was um, it was time for to get dry and get a coffee. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think you were just about to jump in the water for a swim. So yeah, yeah it was it was good to finally catch up and meet you. And um, I'm here today now having a chat, having a chin wag. It's Mate, great. I'm very appreciative of you coming in. I know your time is very You're valuable. Welcome. And the reason I was very eager and keen to get this chat underway is like I said to you, I'd actually scoped you out a little bit before and you were on my list of people to actually contact. And I'm so fascinated by the ocean. Like the ocean completely fascinates me ever since a kid and I'll be honest that actually started with quite a fear for it because as a kid I used I grew up doing little nippers as most you know Aussie kids do Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I was a weapon on the sand but the water scared me it scared me to death because of the power of the ocean it's so unforgiving and the mother nature that lurks within can be quite (laughs) scary at times so as a young buck I was always a little bit nervous getting out on a board or maybe looking like a seal in a wetsuit but as I've gotten older, I, I literally swim in the ocean every day and I'm quite content being the only person out there just after sunrise, you know, to float around in the water and I think it's very levelling and it's very grounding. Yeah, I need it just like the air I breathe. I literally yeah. need to be in the water every every day or every second day. Yeah. Otherwise, my mind gets a little bit crusty and, you know, it's um, it's just part of my life now. I need to be immersed in it every day. But like, like you, like uh, I've spoken to so many people over the years and they have the same similar story that they had a fear of water in the ocean it's great at being around swimming pools because you can it's a controlled environment and never yeah. changes really um, but as soon as you put yourself in the ocean it's a different thing altogether and when you're four or five you have no idea what's happening you know 100%. it's uh, i think my my very first experience that i can recall would have been around sort of four or so yeah. and um, that was in western australia and i was um uh, i've always been exposed to the ocean and the beach uh, my parents grew up in the ocean surfing etc and um i remember clambering around the rock pools and i'd actually sort of jumped into a hole i didn't realize how how deep that hole was and it was gone i was literally looking up at the surface of the water and it's just a small rock pool and when you're sort of four years old it feels like you're in the bottom of the ocean and um, i just remember reaching up and felt the dry air and this is what i can recall anyway and then yeah my dad just just briefed me out of this rock pool yeah and uh, from then on it was kind of like it was it was okay to be underwater, you know, it was, it was great. And then fast forward many years onto that and I'd been in the water diving and fishing and um, snorkeling, but then I took up surfing and bodyboarding and um, yeah, I've got so many experiences, literally spent 30, 40 years in the ocean. Literally so, baptized by the sea. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that fascinates me about your line of work is, and you sort of touched on it there, you grew up with the ocean, which was one of my questions today because I think it really takes it's quite unusual this time of the year you know so we're sitting here i know we've got a couple of listeners from overseas most of the listeners are aussie but at the moment it's it's winter in australia so it is a little bit chillier than it has been 
And I know my mates say to me all the time, how are you still swimming mm. in the sea? Mm -hmm. And it's just that feeling that I love. I love, I think when you're connected to it every day and you're consistently in the ocean, you don't feel the cold as much. But I look at your work and it, it takes serious dedication to be out there pretty much every day looking for a shot. And there's plenty of days sitting there in that steamer where you'd be freezing and, and getting really chilly. So it takes a lot of dedication and I can, I can see that there's a love for it. And a real yeah, appreciation for it for sure um it's the it's beyond passion like it's it's just something that you i need i guess i get as much yeah. out of it as what i put in and i can literally just go it's like it's a repetitious thing that i just get up and go um there's also too this you know the following the way you know whales around the world or the or the different swells and reading yeah. the charts and the weather that all plays a part of it but um i literally would just get in the ocean whether it's one one foot or five foot waves you know i'm shooting um regardless of what the swell's doing or whatever it's just being in the water and yeah. then i find too that um a lot of my shots have come from just if i wasn't there I, I wouldn't have seen it or it didn't happen yeah so um yeah it might might be monotonous and you know it's a little bit crazy getting out in the cold every day but that i guess that's when you find the, the those experiences become more real for you so you're not just um you know picking off a few shots here and there you know i'm out there every day and it's kind of like i get a lot of exercise from it. it's good for my mental health definitely um it literally wakes you up and and you know i feel feel amazing out from a surf but if i if i get out with my camera and i've made one shot out of you know clicking the shutter a thousand times um then that too is rewarding as well so definitely. and then you know, as you know you've spoke i've i do have a gallery and i and i do sell my my images for a living so um I need that to kind of, uh, you know, to, to come up with new images and um, find new ways of shooting and progressing as an artist and evolving, finding new ways to, to interpret the ocean. Um, and, and, you know, that, that means I've got to go out in 15 degree water and yeah. uh, there's, you know, I go right through summer and I come right through winter and, it's, and it, there's less people in the water and the, and the waves are always sort of different. The water seems clearer. It's a beautiful uh, time to swim, actually. It's, it's perfect. You find the hardcore people that do it every day. And I'm talking, you know, they're in their 60s and 70s and they're out there yeah. every day, rain, hail or shine. And I'm overdressed in a steamer, you know, yeah. and these guys and, and ladies are out there in their togs. And um, I don't know about uh, the speedos this time of the year, mate. The water's maybe a little bit cold <laughs> for that, but... I yeah. get I get in there just in the shorts. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit conscious of that. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to see myself in a pair of speedos either. Yeah, so why would I see me some, somebody else? <laughs> but no, you're right. It's uh, it's, geez, it's everything. The ocean's everything. It and is. Uh, when you when you when you love it and you respect it and and um, you you take from it, you also I, I also have that. You know, you've got to give back to it. So if I'm interpreting it in different ways or I'm um, showing people the great sides of the ocean, then hopefully my goal is to um i guess just um show people a different side or perspective of, of the ocean and an appreciation Definitely. of it so they they may think of it a little bit differently and um and the creatures that inhabit it and also um you know it's conserve it it's an environment that we're you know we don't live in but we can look after so yeah it's awesome man so it's just 100%. great and then followed by that coffee and you sit, and I sit up there on the, on the coast there it. and I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. I've just spent two hours in that water there and all I want to do is get back in. A hundred percent. And you feel like you've earned that coffee, that, that warm coffee. So, hey, I'm going to come back to talking about the ocean a little bit in a minute. We're going to, to give you guys a bit of an overview of, uh, as you know, most of these episodes are quite off the cuff and they take, I guess, a, a direction of their own once we start to chat. But definitely want to get into chatting about mother nature within the ocean the power of the ocean and your experiences as well as towards the end we'll chat a little bit about the conservation and, and the way that we should be protecting and looking after the ocean and our environment which is super important but to kick it off i'm i'm really intrigued and we spoke a little bit and touched about it um touched on it before but i'm intrigued by how this all come about because there's many ways you can pick up a camera and there's many shots that can be taken um but the ocean is obviously drawn you to it so mm. how did you start mm. within photography uh should do the long story short thing um let's go with i love the ocean i grew up surfing spent yeah. years and years and years surfing um i uh i injured myself surfing so i actually i uh, did my medial ligament in my leg okay. and from that um i really couldn't I sort of couldn't surf for months on so i looked at other ways to be in the ocean and one of those ways was to teach um 
sorry, not teach my learn uh, scuba diving. Oh, so wow. I actually got my ticket as a scuba diver um, to be in the ocean, but it, you know from a different way. And uh, I learned to love what was below the surface as much yeah. as I did on the surface, you know. So um, and that wasn't as bad on my legs, you know. Yeah. What I was doing is kicking. I was kicking with fins on, but it it, it had a different sort of um, there was a different risk to it. Yeah. And so I did that for about four or five years, and I actually. Um, because I, I love my background is in I love recreational fishing back in the day I was you know, yeah. I, I just love it I'm, and I'm, you know I'm an environmentalist and I'm conservative about the you know the ocean and what's in it um, but I always um, I, I just always had a fascination with it so yeah. um, to spend you know half an hour an hour under the water 20, 20 meters down was just as appealing as yeah. being on the surface, you know, dodging waves or being inside barrels and things like that. So I did that for quite a few years and I'd actually uh, looked into, I got a license to collect tropical marine fish and I had tanks at home and all sorts yeah, of wow. crazy things. Yeah, that's right. It was um, pretty cool. That, and I learned a lot about how some marine tropicals actually end up down in, say, Bass Point. It's really okay. crazy because it's not, you know, the environment to see clownfish and, you yeah, know, and angelfish when they're sort of, they're, they're they're sort of North Queensland, you know, yeah. Cairns and Great Barrier Reef. Um, and then I went on from there to, I did a lot of fishing things. Um, uh, and I was a musician at the time and I needed to build a website for my band. So I taught myself web design and through web design, I ended up building some um, websites that were fishing related uh, and I ended up, there's a couple of fishing personalities I ended up um uh, working for and then got invited to you know fish on their boat and then jump in front of the camera yeah for a couple of seasons of telly and then i did my own thing and i was writing for found i was writing for fishing magazines and yeah, wow. creating videos and things and then from there i progressed on to um uh yeah i was i was, I was surfing the back in surfing through that but um i wanted to get in the water and um maybe take my own photos so i ended up um buying a camera in 2010 and within 12 months i had a water housing and i was creating images of like my goal was to photograph uh, a landscape typical landscape image but from the water so looking back to shore inside a wave like a nat like a okay. natural liquid frame and i just found out how hard that was to do it sort of it was um it was a horrible feeling to think that i just couldn't go out and do it and i look yeah. at look at guys like clark little who who have these amazing waves and shore yeah. break waves over in over in hawaii and i just i said well, geez if you know, I could get something as half as good as one of those photos. I'd be, I'd be very happy. But then, yeah, it took me years and years and years to be yeah. happy with what I was, what I was creating. But we don't have that sort of environment and shorelines and things over that that they do over in. So, what sort of skill set that takes time, right? It's amazing. Just like anything, you have to, yeah. you have to do, you have to put in a lot of hours and you have to do your time. Um, it's funny hearing you talk about fishing. So you're literally sitting across from the world's worst fisherman. Like between me and my old man, we couldn't catch a fish in a tank. <laughs> like right. it's. It's so bad. And I, it actually made me laugh because I had a little giggle there listening to you say that because I, I recalled my first fishing experience. So I remember being five or six and like your first fishing experience with your old man, like that's a moment, you know I what I mean? Mine. Mm, that's I'm a moment. Certainly. So I still remember he bought, we bought a few fishing rods and we bought some bait and we went down to the, the jetty here at Wollongong Harbour. Still remember beautiful day and we're rugged up, ready to fish and threw a line in there probably you know five or six other groups of people fishing off that same jetty and they're all pulling fish in and we're like okay we're catching something for sure <laughs> and we're sitting there nothing nothing and so we moved to this new spot just on the same jetty just on the other side because they seem to be catching a few fish on that side apparently the fish only slip swim on the right side of the jetty we're thinking <laughs> so we cast a line in and i'm sitting there most peaceful day and the next minute just bang pelican shit all over me i was covered in pelican oh, shit and they some experience yeah they seriously cover you like there's some serious coverage there and me and my old man looked at each other and just pissed ourselves laughing like it was so funny awesome and he completely wiped me over with a towel that we had with us and we, we found it so funny so we moved over to the other side again and we're thinking god where's this pelican gone next minute bang round two covered again we end up finding out we're sitting under one of the lights <laughs> and it's just sitting on top oh, of the course, light. We just yeah. couldn't see it vertically sure, above us. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, ever since, I think it's cursed <laughs> me. I can't fish to save my life. So 
but I loved, I always loved the ocean and it was, for me, I was fascinated by dolphins as a kid. So you think of, you know, those crazy cat ladies. I was like the crazy dolphin kid. There were dolphin photos and hmm. plates and dolphin clocks and dolphin sheets in my room. I love wow. dolphins. And I just had this fascination for the ocean. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't get to experience it in its natural habitat. Um, so I'm really intrigued to hear about your first real encounters with these, this great ocean wildlife. Well, oh, geez, it would be just, I guess the first time would be either, either out fishing when you'd be, you'd see like dolphins and yeah. things like that. And then you'd see sharks come up to the side of the boat. Um, and you'd either be freaked out or fascinated or, you know, equal equal amounts of both yeah and then um you know a whale if you're out there and you're, you're, you're drifting and then just, this humpback whale just materializes next to the boat this is like a 30 ton thing yeah and you're like holy shit this is awesome you know this is so good and then um then diving as well so diving with your spear fishing or just snorkeling or um, scuba diving when you can go down to you know to 15 meters and crack open a sea urchin and have a 10 kilo blue groper come up and eat out of your hand it That's just changes incredible. everything, you know. You're just like, oh, this is amazing, you know. You want to, yeah. you want to, you feel like you've got a role to play. Like this is awesome. You can, you can either continue doing what you're doing in life and, and appreciate what that, or what I found was I just wanted to be in there longer, and I wanted to find out more about these fish and different species and things yeah. like that. And that progressed to, you know, being a surfer, and you could talk to every surfer in the world one of their you know it's always in the back of their mind there's going to be a shark out there because you know they've been portrayed differently over the years you know with yeah. movies and jaws and things like that so um and you, you can talk to a hundred of them and find that 99 percent of them will either have something going on them that when you when you swim out in the yeah. dark because you've got to be mindful of them you know they're a, they're, a, they're a big creature and yes they're wild um they've painted been painted you know in the wrong light over yeah, the correct. years as well but but at the end of the day they're a wild creature you know they're just a literally muscle with, yeah. with a mouth you know but they're very intelligent and um they're just they're just fascinating so to be able to get in the water now and and photograph things like that is it's just an absolute privilege yeah i can uh, let's go back to okay so a few years ago now i was speaking to you about a good friend of mine dave sanford he's from canada yeah and um he also had a fascination with great white sharks or sharks in general. So, and so when, scariest, most fascinating creature. It's amazing, and so uh, the great white is probably you know one of the pinnacles of of the breed, the British sharks that I'd wanted to you know, capture just to see in its yeah. natural environment. And uh, we had the opportunity. He invited me to come down to Port Lincoln in South Australia, and um, in your mind you're thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. The place I'm going to is about four hours out from Port Lincoln at a place called the Neptune Islands. And it's a group of islands there that's, um, you know, it's a protected area. Yeah. Um, but it's also the home to um, New Zealand fur seals. So they, they colonize those islands, but yeah. it, they provide, you know, they, they provide food for great white sharks. You know, yeah. and they've got these sharks that come through and they, they move around and they come to there for a couple of months and, and that before they move on and, and they'll feed on these New Zealand fur seals, amongst other things. And um, the goal was to get down there, you know, in, in one of the boats down there. And um, we go out and drop down into a cage and mm. literally see them at the back of the boats. And oh, it's just, it's hard. Like the, the first time you literally, you've got a camera. You can put yourself in my shoes, right? So you're leaving the port at Port Lincoln and you're on a boat. There's about 40 or so. Get different people from all over the world, tourists, yeah. you know, come down and they've, there are so a different demographic too. So you've got people that are uh, 15, 14, 15, all the way up to sort of 80, 90 years old from different parts of the world. And they're all, they've all got these like maybe expectations, what they're going to see or how they're going to feel or yeah. what they're going to experience. And you travel out through the heads and it's like a nice hour long, flat, calm. You're watching the sun come up. There's rainbows. Literally, it's raining. Amazing. The sun's coming. It's absolutely amazing. Dolphins coming past the boat. And then everyone's sitting there eating cups, you know, eating scones and cup of tea and we're all chatting, getting to know each other. And then you go through the heads and the skipper's like, all right, guys, you know, it's going to be a bit bumpy. And yeah. so this is another two and a half, three hours of going through swell that might be four metres. Yeah, and, wow. and so big that we can't even turn the boat around, literally going through these these waves and they're breaking over the bow and there's water coming down over the top and, and people just naturally 
can't hack it, you know. So yeah. <laughs> you look out, everyone goes from being this buzzing, excited, you know, everyone's chatting yeah. to each other and they're, they're really anxious about what we're going to see. Yeah. And then within half an hour, sort of that, that just sort of slows down. The talk goes, you know, there's minimal talk. You look around and everyone's starting to get flushed and they're losing the colour in their face yeah. and then they start to turn green and then bang, down the transom, which is the back of the boat. Yeah. And they're all down there hanging on and they're just like limp and they're spewing yeah. and it's like, this in itself is hardcore. A hundred percent. You know, so you got people that, oh, we, we had someone on there that was like, I think they're three guys and they come from WA and they, two of them were 89 and one was 90. Oh, and they were wow. doing like a bucket, their bucket list, right? And so just to endure that boat ride in itself is super stressful in the body and the mind. hundred percent. So you're going out there and you're just like, you can't stop. So the whole way out there, we're trying to help them and feed them, take their mind off it. I'm taking photos, I'm talking to people. And generally, I get seasick, but nowhere near as much as this. Yeah. And we finally. So you're up. like the G- George Clooney, perfect storm of the boat. You're the guy that's keeping it together. You're Maybe. the glue holding the group together. Maybe I think if I concentrate <laughs> on everyone else being sick yeah. and trying to make them feel better, yeah. I can take the focus off me. Yeah. It's all got to do with your, your, your mind and equilibrium and everything. So get out there, and you finally come to this calm water, and we're just we're pulling people up off the back of the boat, saying, you know get in the water it's going to be amazing going to change so the water goes from you know you're down in south australia so the water itself is like 12 degrees 10 degrees yeah and so you have to don on like an eight mil dive suit so it's okay for someone like myself to get into a suit but helping these these people that are in their 80s and you know 90 years old getting in the king and so they launch um this is with a a company called calypso star charters they launch a a um this big eight person six to eight person cage off the back and um the idea is to just literally get onto this cage turn around and walk down into this thing when you get a you get a hooker line it's like a breather line scuba diving thing and you get down and you just get into your position inside this cage and you're about a meter below the surface and you're looking through this this gap in the cage and it's literally like you've just been transformed into a movie because you don't know yeah. like you, you just no one's you know there's not a lot of people have seen a shark let alone a shark but like, you know, yeah. like we're talking like a five meter great white just comes out of the blue, comes up and then turns and then goes away. And then you just, everyone's just, did you see that? Yeah. You know, they're like yeah. looking and they're pointing and whatever. And so I'm just, I'm there with Dave and we're just, this is the best thing that's ever happened because we've always wanted to see these yeah. things. And so, but we've, we're lucky we've got cameras in our hands too. So we're underwater and next thing the, the sharks will come up and, you know, we, we get to document it. So it's like the best, it's Amazing. one of the best feeling, best experience. It feels surreal. Yeah. It feels like you're part of a movie, like some sort of 100%. movie. And yet then I'm trying to concentrate and make photos as well. So it's, it's kind of like really, really crazy. And you get out and you're just full of all these emotions. You don't know how to feel. It's like exciting. It's, you know, you, you, you're overcoming, you know, different yeah. things that you've sort of conceived about this, about sharks and things. So you get out of the water and it's just like the most amazing thing. I've done, I've been down there to three or four years now you know done oh, amazing, different, amazing. different trips and mm. have you ever had one of those encounters uncaged though um there's probably been two or three moments along the south coast because we yeah. do have a lot of different species that'll inhabit the waters here yeah uh, we have um bull sharks and whalers you know yeah. bronze whalers um hammerheads gray nurse and then we have a lot of um great whites as well yeah and there has probably been, oh, let's say, in the last five years, I've probably counted about six or seven visible shark like sightings okay. from the water in the water. Yep. So you kind of you go through different emotions. You're, you're yeah. thinking, do I get out? Do I stay? If it's been out there and I've seen it, it's probably been out with me for half an hour or an hour, yeah. sussing everything out or eating, you know, chasing salmon and things like yeah. that. Um, and a lot of those places aren't, aren't the hard, the easiest place to get straight up. You've literally got to either come straight up the top of rocks or swim back to okay. shore. So you've kind of, you've got to be, yeah, you just always mindful strategic, of, yeah. yeah, for sure. It does, but it just humbles you. It, it gives you that, you know, that sense that you this is their, this is their playground. They you know, live here, you know. See, that's the thing, right? I was, you, you touched on it there before. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions about these creatures and their place in the ocean but it literally is their home it's their habitat and i guess i always compare it to have you ever heard of a gentleman named boyd vardy no so boyd vardy's a lion tracker in south africa he's got an amazing in fact anyone listening to this would also love aubrey marcus has a podcast he's actually joe rogan's business partner and on it 
and I've spoken about this podcast, maybe one of my favourite listens ever. Um, he does this episode with Boyd Vardy and my, my good mate Joe Plum, who was episode three on the potty, referred me to that episode and he's sitting there talking with Boyd Vardy and it's basically called The Lion Tracker's Guide to Life. So hmm. he talks about being a lion tracker and how all that sort of stuff is relative in everyday life mm -hmm. for most people. And hearing him speak about being face to face with a lion in the middle of the jungle and understanding that you were there in its habitat. And if you've made the mistake of becoming too close or too closely encountered with that creature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a few strategic things that you can do, but you're now in Faye's hands. And funnily enough, if someone is killed by a lion, everyone goes, well, what were they doing in the middle of the jungle? Mm -hmm. What were they doing chasing lions? Someone's killed by a shark. We get all these people that go, get rid of the shark. Absolutely. It's yeah. kind of not how it works. You know, no, like no. we're pretty comfortable in our nice apartments and our houses and going to bed cozy at night. But when you step into their domain, it's their domain. And I think it's, that's one of the things I love about the ocean so much because it levels you, it grounds you. you you're literally almost in many ways a, a prisoner or just a passenger to what the conditions are or what the creatures are in that space that day. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love jumping in. I think you get out with such a better and more relaxed headspace yep. mm -hmm. because in those moments you understand that power. So. It is, and it is. It's um, it's quite sobering. I think, uh, like, I, I, I'll be out there. So the best light for me is morning and evening yeah. um, to capture, you know, that, those colours and uh, <coughs> different interpretations, abstracts and things like that. But that colour only happens at those certain times of yeah. the day. So you can't see what's under the water because the water's dark. Yeah. Uh, so you either feel comfortable or you just, you shouldn't, you know. Yeah. It, you, 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 I don't know, it can freak people out. Um, 100%. But um, when you're comfortable with what... See, I, I've been doing it for quite a, quite a while now and I have... I'm, I'm happy if that's the way I go, um, you know, in terms yeah. of that, if I drown or if something happens. Um, but, yeah, you have to, you have to be comfortable in, the, in those environments. But also, too, you know, you do... When I, when I was in diving with those sharks, I am in a cage and I... And I and I'm, I'm not professing to be an expert or anything because I'm, I'm behind that, you know, that aluminium yeah. or steel. Uh, there are people out there who free dive with sharks every day. Incredible, and, you know, right. those, If I could aspire to be, you know, something 10% of what they do in their environment, they spend their entire life, um, they analyse shark behaviour and they, yeah. they're looking at the different personalities and how and why they feed and why they aren't, you know, a threat to us and things like that. So... Um, if I could ever experience something like that, that would be, oh, be incredible. I don't even care if I had a camera just to be in the water face to face in their environment, you know, yeah. with no shield in front of me. That would be amazing. But at the same time, you just don't know. Like they're just, yeah. they're, you know, you, you can be diving with an animal for years and years and years in their environment and one day it can turn on you and can become aggressive. You don't know because, you know, you, know, just, you don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. But most of the time when, when they do that, they're analysing these creatures for for hours and hours and hours every day, um, they're always gonna, there's always gonna be a percentage of unpredictability about their behavior, but most of the time, you know, they're, they're, just, being, they're just curious, you know, they'll come up and suss us out. I've, I've resigned to the fact that if I'm out in the water in the dark or any time, that there are creatures in the water there that have been there for hours. Yeah. You know, I could have been bumped by a piece of seaweed or I could have been the fin of a shark or, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, and that's cool. Yeah. Because I'm still here to talk about it. 100%. You know? um, but, um, yeah, I guess there, I mean, shark attacks aren't prolific. No, you know, they're where not. Where we are compared to different parts of the world I think I read that more people well. are killed by cows a year than sharks. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge difference in the stats, yeah. you know. But uh, yeah, there, at the same time, you know, we have this technology and I've always kind of maintained that there are always sharks out there. There always have been and I hope, 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 that they always will be but the technology you have now with drones um, people with gopros yeah, exactly. in the water um, more people more humans um, populate the world so more people are actually in the ocean at any yeah. given time so if you get if you bring those factors into play there are more people documenting um, spreading the news instantly about there's a shark sighted such and such down the coast yeah. and there may be an app that tells you um you look at the app and it's like, wow, there's a shark at Minamara. I was just there. Wow, that freaks me out. 
Yeah. But at the same time, if that app wasn't available or people didn't have, you wouldn't know. They wouldn't know, and you would just go along, go up yeah. on doing your doing your thing. So um, that hype is also, or that sort of fear can be increased or heightened yeah. because people are have that access to that technology. If you were down North Beach and you you just went for a swim, right? Yeah. And um, you came out and you know you felt great and you and you went to work. And then you read on one of these apps or on say Facebook or Instagram that there was a great white shark at North Beach. While you were there, how would you feel? You know, and it's kind of yeah. like, wow, that's pretty cool, but also f- kind of frightening at the same time. Yeah. Most people would sort of think that's pretty scary. But without that technology, that's you, wouldn't pr- know. you wouldn't know. So it's, um, I don't know, like there, there is a, that perception is always, always on the sort of the negative side, but it's kind of, um, people that are into the environment and love the ocean and its inhabitants always have to, they've got a job to do, you know, to show people that they are beautiful creatures doing their thing. Hmm, exactly. I'm going to come back to something you said just a few moments ago where you spoke about those moments in the water, even if you're without your camera. And it makes me think because there's often, <clears throat> there's often a conversation that the world we live in is so heavily documented now. And obviously your camera is a part of your life. It's, it's how you document your art. It's how you make your living. Um, and it's a big part of what you do every day. And I'm the type of guy that loves to capture moments as well and look back on them. Like I often look back on um, my social feeds where I you know, spread a lot of memories with family and friends and those sort of things and look back with some quite joyous moments there to recall. What is the balance between having that camera all the time and then sometimes just being in the moment where it's just you and it's just your memory and experience? It's so vital that you have to, as a photographer... Um the things that you love about what you do, you have to constantly remind yourself why you're doing that. Yeah. And you have, and you, and you have to recharge that, sort of that that feeling of being in the ocean while the sun's rising. Why look at it through a look a, a little viewfinder every single time you go out, or why? Yeah. You know, if I, I for an example, I went to uh, Vavau a couple of years ago in Tonga. Okay. And I had the the opportunity to dive with humpback whales. Yeah. And my first experience diving with a humpback whale was a it was a male whale it was probably about 15 meters below the surface and yeah. it was sort of just sitting there and it was singing and it was um they're fascinating it's eh? incredible you know and you've got this thing that's this vibrating this sound it's almost deafening i did have my camera in my hand but i wasn't even i wasn't even worried about it because you couldn't hold on you couldn't even it was that violent like it was really yeah it was making all these sounds you know the, the sounds are typical whale sounds yeah. and, um it's it's a form of communication as well for them. So the further the closer you get to them, the, the the more violent that sound is. Literally vibrating the water and the sounds going yeah. through the water. And um, I remember, I just didn't even I didn't even bother. I just wanted to experience that because it's so like I was saying, so important that as someone who either documents things or creates images of of say whales, um, it's you have to experience that first. And you have to constantly remind yourself to put down the camera yeah. and, and just um, look and listen and feel that because it's evoking emotions and things as well. So yeah. um, if, if you want to portray how beautiful a whale is to somebody or show them you know, how incredible this creature is, if I don't remember any other experiences other than looking through the lens of my camera, yeah. I'm, I'm just might as well just watch other photographers' photos. You know, yeah. um, It's like surfing. It's like... Um, I take photos of waves and, and big empty waves and things. I just put down the camera sometimes and just watch it yeah. because it's just, it's like, wow, it's so crazy. And that's why I get out there. I want to show people what I'm seeing. Yeah. I've also got it too. But then, you know, there are photos that people never see of mine. I'll, I'll take photos of things or waves and sharks and whatever that they're just, they're kind of just for me. Yeah. You know, so I, I love the fact that, yes, I do have a job. <coughs> My role as a photographer is to um, share imagery. Yeah. But also too, it's yeah, it's one of those things you can't give away everything, otherwise you it's have nothing for yourself. Yeah, it's it's got to be a balance. I, it's actually funny, like sitting here with you today, an article popped up on Facebook this morning, and it must have been the universe sending me a topic to discuss <laughs> um, because it, I think it was ABC um, put it out. It was about whales, humpback whales, and how I think thirty odd years ago, um, the number of humpback whales within the ocean and how that's actually massively increased right. um, to this day. Yep. Sort of, what do you know much about like ocean conservation and like wildlife conservation in the o- in the ocean? 
Do you study much of that? I do follow quite a bit of it. Yep. Um, when I was a recreational fisher and I started getting into the conser- conservation side of it, I was looking at uh, the effects of professional long liners and netting would have on um, you know, fish stocks um, yep. um, and all those things, right down to bait fish and what it still does. You know, people, you know, they're just yeah. netting large groups of bait fish, but that takes out a chunk of the, you know, the, the, the things that feed on those so they move elsewhere. Or, yeah. Um, so I, I did have an interest in all that, but going back to your whales, uh, I listened to the same interview because I'm fascinated with it as well. And I love the fact that I am a member of Orca. So I've actually, I'm a okay. registered member of Orca, which um, we rescue like injured or beached cetaceans. So whales and dolphins and oh, wow. seals and turtles and things like that. Um, which so what I've, does that entail? Uh, so that if, if we have, if, for example, if we have a, a whale that's unfortunately beached itself yeah. due to injury or... Um, there's a lot of factors we don't know about why, why they do that. So uh, I'll, a, a member of the public will probably r- ring that in to someone like the police or orca. Yep. And then being a local um, closest to that, I would be notified and see if I can attend that. And I would literally um, look after that that animal, um, cordon the place off, um, look, you know, make sure it's okay yep. uh, until other people come down, specialists and and things come down and uh, so that's one of my that's one of my roles as an orca member that that would be such an amazing feeling to know you've helped one of those creatures it is um you ever had an experience i've had quite a few experiences um let's go back to that but i'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just go i'll just touch on so uh, 30 years ago they were talking about they may have seen a couple of hundred whales yep you know and every year this is um that they've been taking statistics and counting the migration they have seen like an increase of about 10 to 15 percent per year yeah so we're looking at thousands of whales now yeah and and that's because um you know they're protected there's no more whaling there's no more commercial whaling in australia yeah i I thought that would be a big thing it's huge so um they're not a resource now they're not looked upon as a resource yeah Um, and so we're caring for these creatures more so than you know hunting them yeah and um yeah, we're seeing them come back tenfold. They'll go to Tonga and they'll go to up and down the coast, all the way th- around the world, and they, you know, they'll bear their children and their calves, and their calves will come along next time, you know. And you'll see, you probably will see an increase of um, um, white whales over yeah. the next decade or two, because if they're, you know, if they're populating and they're growing uh, in in uh, numbers, we'll probably see a lot more of them, which is super exciting. Yeah, you know, yeah, they think cool. there was like a migaloo, and now there's probably three or so, three or four. Yeah. Uh, white whales that have been sighted in different parts and so let's go back to um let's go back to the orcas uh, sorry yeah. let's go back to orca um i had uh it's, it's an absolute pri- privilege to be there when oh, something like that happens but it's also quite sad like yeah. so for an example uh, i was i was present when um a couple of years ago we had a, a beached calf that probably would have been a couple of years old and this thing's like one and a half two ton you know and it's a giant it's a it's a big creature that's come up the beach and all of its weight because it's usually you know in floating in water so when you've got this big creature on the land it doesn't have the structure that we have yeah it's literally like can crush itself you know just by okay. being on land so and you get all these people around and this thing's looking at you the whole time yeah, it would and, be, and, yeah. you're, and, you're, and you're trying to say think about how you can save its life or get it back in the water and if a if a calf's been away from its mother for too long, it yeah. can they can separate and she can keep going. Um, you know, it needs okay. to, it needs a lot of milk to to survive too. So yeah. if that food source isn't there, unfortunately, it's not going to make it. And um, yeah, this this particular whale, we nursed it for many many hours, and unfortunately, to to its demise. Yeah. So it's very it's very sad. Like you come away with that thinking, wow, you know, there was a lot of effort. Yeah. To try and sustain this thing's life as long as you can. And it didn't work out for the best. But then it, what it does is it makes you think even harder. We've got to look after these creatures even more. And um, the next time it happens, hopefully when it's in a different circumstance or it might not be injured, you know, and there's procedures that we have to, you know, adhere to. I was going to say there would be, yeah, quite um, strict, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've had, uh, I've, I've seen seals, a lot of seals, um, the odd turtle. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen a dolphin yet, but I've seen... Um, a whale or two um, I've even seen a leopard seal would you believe which is oh, quite wow. out of the ordinary yeah, yeah. for up here and I believe from what I, they could work out was let, um, it had a few injuries to its head so it may have had a, a fight with another 
male seal in that, that okay. pack and sort of kicked out. Who knows, you know. Yeah. Uh, so fascinating, you know. Yeah, we've, wow. we've got a coastline that's pretty, it's pretty harsh coastline. So, you know, for something to come up on the rocks and we get called, we might be called on a beach that's yeah. hard to access and things like that. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty cool, you know. Um, We're pretty lucky here, aren't we? Like, mm. to be located where we are, I don't think a lot of people, you know, I've got a few listeners here. I don't know if we've got too many people from the US just yet, but we've got some um, Kiwi listeners. We've got some listeners from the UK, as well as many around Australia who probably still don't understand and appreciate the beauty of the south coast of New South Wales here Mm -hmm. and how lucky we are and how surrounded by the ocean and the mountains that we are. And I think one thing that for me, one of the, the positives out of an extremely negative situation at the beginning of the year with the bushfires was I think it it leveled people and made people understand how I guess how vulnerable our wildlife is with how many you know creatures that we lost through those fires and I think that combines the ocean with with the land as well and it it makes people appreciate how lucky we are to have this wildlife and how much we have to protect it and it's nice to see people remember that again because really it's part of the beauty that makes the world. You know, and I watch, I've always yeah. loved watching Attenborough and those sort of documentaries and you think what a fascinating life that guy's had because mm-hmm. the one amazing thing about wildlife is it's so honest. Mm. You know, you, you know in, in a matter of moments what the intention of that animal is and the intention is quite, quite pure and quite raw in many occasions, which is unlike human beings, mm-hmm. um, where sometimes it takes a little while to figure out what someone's true intentions are. Correct. So yeah, what right. what for you has been the most fascinating creature to work with or to photograph? Yeah, definitely the whale. Like I yeah. started out um, photographing turtles on Lady Elliot Island. It was my goal to go there okay. and photograph because it's a it's a sanctuary zone. This is at the Southern Great Barrier Reef, and it's a it's a part of the, an island chain at the bottom, Lady Musgrove, and uh, at the top Fraser. So you've yep. got this you've got this island, and it's just it's just fascinating. You fly up from Harvey Bay. And you land on this runway and either side of this island is just a um, beautiful reef and, you know, it's uh, it's all self-sustained. So to visit okay. this island, you're literally going there knowing that um, it's an eco-resort. Okay. And so one of the fascinating things is also too, it's like, uh, other than being a uh, breeding ground for turtles, yeah. it's, um, it's one of the most highly populated areas for manta rays. So there's okay. like, um, that is awesome too, you know, and you get to swim out and you see something that's three or four meters wide just gliding past you like a sail, you know, underwater. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, turtles as well. They're just, a, you know, unassuming. They're just doing their thing. It's just, you know, they're not out to hurt anybody, but they're just, a, you know, they're a, they're, they've been around for a long time, you know, turtles. Yeah. So to photograph a turtle with all their, you know, their mottled, you know, uh, shell and everything. But then from to go from that, I've seen a few whales here and there. But to go over and photograph one, and oh, it's just incredible. So uh, to slide off the back of a boat after sort of searching for a few out there and, you, and you've got your fins on your mask and you slide into the water so you, you're not to scare them and you swim over to something that's um, a size of a bus, essentially. Mm. And it's either by itself or got a, got a child with it, you know, like yeah. a calf. And that, uh, you know, you're sitting you're underwater and nothing does it justice. You literally, my, like I was saying before... Um, that first experience, I just literally, I dived down and I stayed down as long as I could and I come to the surface yeah. and my mask was just filled with tears. Like I was literally, you, oh, can't, art- you can't articulate what you're feeling because it's such a big creature, you know, it's so powerful. And if it really wanted to, it'll tell you that it doesn't want you there. Yeah. But um, they're so spatially aware, they're so gentle yeah. They're watching you the whole time because they, you know, their eyes sort of move around and yeah. seeing you from from every angle. But if it didn't want you there, it would tell you. But yeah, we were very respectful and we'll, we'll approach them, you know, to a yeah. point where they just come to us and okay. to swim past something that's literally, you know, like I said, the size of a bus, and it'll drag its pectoral fin in and it'll just swim right past you and its eyes, you know, the size of this um, pop filter. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you're literally it's looking at you, and it knows. It just knows. It's like you're okay, you know? Yeah. And then you just, you just get out of the water and it's like, wow, did that just even happen? That's just crazy. And you you know that you're one of very few people that will ever experience that in the flesh. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of places in the world to do it and there's not a lot of people that get to do that because it's Definitely quite, not. you know, it's quite a, I won't say it's, you know, 
cheap to do. It's not something you can just go down the beach. You really yeah. have to have that. You have to be driven to go and do it. And um, to just to see it and experience is probably you know, bar none. Nothing comes close. If you can get a photo of a whale as a photographer and you're really something that you wanted to capture and you come home with it, it's still the photo still doesn't do that experience justice. Yeah. But, um, you know, to go out there and swim with them, I'll be a few dozen different types of whales now and different yeah. personalities and their calves come up out of the water and they're splashing, breaching, you know, a few meters away from you. It's, it's pretty cool. It humbles you because you, you it makes you feel like insignificant, you, yeah. you know, as a human, it's like, yeah. what did we do to these creatures for so many yeah. years? And then at the same time, you come away with, wow, that I've got important, I mean, I've got an important job to do 100%. To, to show people that what's the, these are worth, you know, saving and, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just awesome. That, that to me has been the, the pinnacle of my photography career. That's amazing. Sure. Do you remember that moment, oh, it's probably a couple of years ago now, where I can't remember what type of whale, it might have been a humpback, um, but come through Bondi. And you yes. remember that, that mm. surfer that just got a little bit too close to the tail mm-hmm. and caught some air time? Oh. I still remember seeing those images. And um, it's just fascinating to see that creature in the water mm. near the surface and to see those surfers who look like ants they do. Yeah, around yeah, yeah. a human being. And yeah, it's just, it's awesome to have those experiences and, you know, lucky enough that you can come back, reflect on that and, and have a, an image that you know you've taken. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think more people need to, it's, it's okay seeing it on the TV, yeah. um, experiencing it through photography, but the more people that interact with nature, um, that sort of hands-on approach where they're looking at an animal directly in its eye, they'll it changes people so that give them more, more appreciation and respect for the natural environment and they'll want to change their habits and you know, how it affects what they do every day that affects them so definitely more people that experience it the better for sure let's talk business i guess um for most people in wollongong they'll they'll walk up Kemble street and recognize your shop it's been there for many years mm. what was the inspiration to first actually open a gallery we live in quite a digital world but that shop's been there for Maybe a little bit longer than digital presence has been um, quite significant. So, what what made you open the gallery? Um, with any, if you, if, if you if you delve into the world of photography, and then you further the photography into the print world, you go and yeah, get your your images printed. That's a whole new form of art as well. So, taking the photograph is awesome, but then going and printing it and translating that to paper is a whole new different thing. And if yeah. if you're fascinated with the print world then little lights go off in your head. It's like, wow, well, it doesn't matter what you're doing at the moment, whether you've got a trade or you've got a different job, which is kind of what I had at the time. Um, I was a web developer. I was working from home, yep. had a bit of time on my hands. And um, for, for every t- photographer, there's like a little thing that they love in their minds. Like, I want, I'd love to have a gallery. I'd yep. love to have something where I can showcase my art, my images all the time. And I guess back, let's go back 10 years ago and further, where you'd have... You'd have, um, I guess, the digital world and that presence wasn't as strong. So you rely on newspapers and print, you know, magazines and books and all these things that that happened in that that era. Uh, And so one of those things was like printing your work and and showcasing it in people's homes and offices and things like that. So that thought was quite attractive to me just to, you know, it'd be awesome to have that dream, live the dream as a photographer and and work in a gallery and have your own artwork. So... um, yeah, like it went 10 years ago, it was 2010 when I first bought my camera and I, I guess I started um, printing my work a year into that. Yeah. Uh, and I was very, very lucky that one of my, my, my good friends, Brent Rasmussen, who was a photographer and, and had galleries of his own, he ventured into the world of print, okay. not only for himself, but he started doing it for other people. Okay. And um, I could uh, print my work through him and see how that would evolve and see, you know, okay. what, and I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, why don't I maybe do a, an exhibition? And I did a couple of exhibitions down in Shaw Harbour. Yep. And, you know, to, to my surprise, it, it went pretty well. And um, um, I thought, you know, there's all these little green lights going off. And I was getting, I was getting quite, um, uh, what's the word for it? I was thinking, maybe I could do this. This is yeah. pretty cool. Maybe I could sort Excitement of builds. leave my job. And I had all these different skills, I guess, um, from being a musician and in, into the into web design and design and things like that. I could maybe use those skills to run a business. 
yeah. another business because I was also doing those things. Um, and yeah, so to touch on something there, I was like 2010 was a, we were trying to, my wife and I had, we kicked a few goals and we thought this is what we want, we have property and bits and pieces and we thought let's try to have kids, let's, you know, yeah. tick those boxes and unfortunately that didn't happen. So um, we we looked at life differently and after a couple of curveballs we thought let's change our goalposts and let's, you know, shift them into a different realm and then we decided to move into Wollongong um, for I was living at the time was out Mount Warrigal Albion Parkway yeah. and um, we moved into Wollongong and I was working from home as a web developer and I was selling prints through you know putting a photo up on Facebook and having someone go oh, that's awesome I'd love to have a print of that yeah and this light went off in my head I was like I could you know I could do this so um, Kembla Street we'd, I'd, I'd walk past it you know every couple of days and there wasn't much going on in that area back then. So this is going no, back in yeah. 2013. And uh, this little space came up for lease and I thought, wow, this is affordable. Um, what if? And so I just I just took a risk and opened, opened a shop, put my name on a door and uh, got a bunch of prints made up and some lights and things and called it a gallery. And, and you know, from there it's been seven, just over seven years now. And that that's, street's evolved, you know? Yeah. And credit to you because that's a long time. Like it's it's definitely a business that is a niche, you know? Like it's not an everyday expense for people to go and spend money on a print or an image. So to have that shop for seven years, credit to you. That's, Thanks. you know, mm. I think that's a really good achievement. It, you're right. It's a, I guess art is considered a luxury item. Yep. And, you know, even the current period that we're in right now. Correct, yeah. With... Um, you know, pandemic and COVID and then, you know, the bushfires and things like that. Um, putting something on your wall is not seen as a priority item. You know, it's sort of more food and paying the bills. Yeah, definitely. So to make it through those kind of times, um, don't forget I have a, an online presence as well. So um, I'm selling a few pieces around the world. Yep. And that sustained me. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And, um, yeah, it's so amazing. It's just completely rewarding when someone wants to come into the store, not only have a chat with me um, and share some experiences, but to take something away yeah, or, definitely. or order something online and um, put that up in their home or office. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's the best feeling. So, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm very lucky to be able to do that. I've t- had a few um, you know, opportunities, but also risked a lot to do it. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's not, you know, like I, I always say this to people, if they're in high-end jobs, you know, and they work long hours and they travel a lot, you know, and their their bank balance shows how much work they put into what they do, and they say, you know, like, oh, I'd love to do what you do, photography. Go and photograph whales or sharks, you know, turtles, and jump in the ocean every day and take photos. And I think, well, that comes at a price. You know, it's not a it's not a monetary yeah. value. There's it's there's a lot of people that are photographers that I know and considered professional on top of their game, and they've got other jobs. You know, just to yeah. make, just to make a living because it's, you know, it's it's one of those things where perception is the killer. You could have definitely a million followers on Instagram, and still not be able to make a living off what you do. You know, what, that's one of the things I really appreciated when we first met. We sat there and we had that conversation over a coffee, and you said basically that, and it really struck a chord with me because that was you know, that was a financial decision that I had to make. I went from you know I'm 24 years old, so I was making pretty comfortable money and probably would have made a whole lot better money the next five years with my career progression. And I had to make a decision that, okay, how much does the comfort of a bank balance and those material things mean to me right now? And it just didn't mean as much as happiness and it didn't mean as much as passion did. And, you know, I'm sitting here now in front of a mic and this is now how I plan to make my living, but not quite yet. And financially, that's a major sacrifice. There are many things that you can't afford to do now. You have to be a little bit smarter and humbler with the way that you spend. Um, you know, you, you're smarter about those coffees you buy and those meals you have out. But there's a real satisfaction in making something or or having some form of satisfaction come from your work when you're passionate about it. And we spoke about it just prior to coming on air where you just touched on then that feeling of someone coming in and connecting with a piece of your art or one of those prints and buying that and putting that in their home and featuring something that you've created in their home or their office space. 
And I mentioned how it feels to get a positive message or, you know, a five-star rating or a lovely review on podcast app. That lights my fire now. And I realise that those moments for me mean more than money. And I think those moments would mean more than money for majority of people in life. But Mm. it just takes sometimes throwing yourself in the deep end to figure that out. Because money is a creature comfort. It it, it is. And it's, um, I guess, hopefully it won't always be, but... Firstly, congratulations for what you're doing. Thank you. It's, um, it really does take a lot to, I guess, look at your life and what really means the most to you and what sort of impact you want to have while you're here, you know, in this in a human form. Yeah. So if you if you are comfortable in what you do and you can derive an income from what you what you're doing, but there's something eating away at you, thinking, Far out, this isn't fueling my yeah. soul. You know, how am I going to better myself as a human being or, or even share that, share experiences or, or with other people of or other people's experiences with your listeners? Yeah. And to, to take a step back from something that you're comfortable with and you have security, job security, you know, and, and it takes a lot, man. It's, it's, not just, it's, it's not just going, I'm going to try this for a couple of months and see how it goes. It's literally, you know, everything that you work for to reach a platform where you're going, holy cow, like in five years time, I could be doing this much or selling this much. And in your case, yeah. what you're doing professionally prior to this or during this. And, and you think, what, and, and you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm on my way, you know, closer to 50 than I am your age. So I think, wow, what if I get to 50 and I haven't done those things or I didn't try or just didn't even give 100%. it a go. And you got to take a step off the ledge sometimes and think, you know, if I drown figuratively if you drown it's like okay well i'll start again if you do something else and success is is literally you know the amount of failures you had prior to that before you actually feel comfortable and you feel truly happy with what you're doing yeah and i think without getting into it too spiritually it's um you make more of an impact you 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 just feel like you it's a bit more real you know like your 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 existence matters because 100 percent. you know like we're discussing prior to this um you've had some people on that have share their experiences courageously but also too um, they'll never know or they kind of will know through your feedback but also too the greater reach that you have 100%. how much of an impact will that help you know people and if you if you were the vehicle for that and you have that rapport with people then i think you've got a great role to play and it's i don't think anyone can do your previous job but it there's not a lot of people can do what you do as well so yeah. i think they're the the things that you have to tap into utilize and you know make the most of because i guess you can always come back to your previous job can't you i mean you can 100%. you can do that down the track and that's one of the things that um property is going to be there you know there's always going to be someone that wants to buy something and someone wants to sell something if you can connect it to and you do that as a job that's yeah. great you can do that down the track you yeah. don't there's no age limit on you know what you do so uh i think yeah you've got an important role to play and i think so far from what i've seen and you know it's it's an honor to be sitting here talking to you about it. my experiences too mate so but it means thank a you lot. yeah for sure it's funny because i guess you know i've I done an episode quite recently on why i left real estate and it was a number of life realizations and that i'm blessed to have had at 23 24 years of age but you know it's you, you touched on it earlier you mentioned that story of being on that boat heading down to to see the great whites in south australia and those 80 or 90 year old fellas that were there to tick off their bucket list. And I love that's that movie, The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman, I think is, hey Hunter, the dog's having a little bark here. He, like, he must like the movie too. Um, I absolutely love that movie because it is, it's so true to life. You get to that point where time is running out and at what point do you realise how important the experiences you have and the memories are that let you rest easy and let you feel great about the life you've had. Mm. And I'm just chasing those moments now. Like I'm chasing those feelings that allow me to be satisfied with my day to day or my week to week. And I got sick of living for Sunday. And I just, I hope that more people find that balance of passion and, and work in life and understand. So a lot of people probably listening to this going, well, you know, I've got kids or a mortgage or this or that. And I can't make that plunge and I completely respect that. But I say, you know, find that time in your life to have those passions and explore those curiosities because, man, life gets pretty pretty bland without it. You know, you don't have to make 
you don't it doesn't have to be the highest cliff that you step off you know it can just be a step and if it's something that you're passionate about or you're intrigued by just give it a go because you just don't know and if you don't if you never do it then you kind of you know i just don't want to regret anything that's what i was saying before like i shifted my goalposts and i wanted a life rich with experiences and that, that comes at a price and so for me, that was more important at the time and, and still is yeah. rather than um, the things that I can't take with me hundred percent. at the end of it all. So um, I'm sitting here talking to you and I have a few things to say, you know, like those experiences are pretty cool and pretty crazy. But it's, it's still, for me, it's really weird because it's still not enough. Yeah, and awesome I get that. And I'm content with it. And there'd be some of the things that, you know, there's a few people that I just love to do. Yeah. But for me, it's like I, I'm in the position now where you know, I don't have kids. Um, I'm not tied down by mortgages. I, you know, there's a lot of things where I can just literally pack up and go for two months or you know, awesome. six weeks or whatever and just, and just go and do something. You know, That's a nice freedom to have. It's an absolutely. But it's also the security's not there. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, good, it's a balance, right? So you can't right. be... Um, there's not a lot of people that can say, okay, well, I'm financially stable for the rest of my life and I'm just going to go and do what I want to do. Yeah. You know, so that's, uh, you know, I could, I, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. I, I've been pretty, pretty lucky that I've, you know, I've sustained a few injuries over the years as well. Yeah. They're things that sort of hold you back and, you know, prevent you from doing what you do. But giving and sharing experiences is kind of like, that's high on my list, you know, of, um, and helping other people out too. So uh, uh, one of the other sides of my businesses I have, other than selling prints, um, I actually run, um, another business called Vagabond Photographic and there's myself and three other guys yep. including Russell Lord another amazing ocean photographer from WA yep. and we have launched a platform where we teach photography ocean that's, photography that's an amazing segue because literally my next question for you was what would your advice be to those people looking to begin yeah cool awesome it's, uh, so it's a very <coughs> I guess ocean photography was and kind of still is a very niche Thing. Yeah. So, you know, uh, to take a camera into the water to take photos, it literally changes everything. For me, it did anyway. You have to, lo- you have to love the ocean. You have yeah. to be, you know, inspired by just getting up and looking at it, but also being immersed in it. Yeah. So if you, take your, if you take a love of making images and pictures and then your love of the ocean, if you can combine the two, that's kind of the pinnacle of my happiness. Yeah. Um, if you were able to teach somebody else how to do it. So when I first started 10 years ago, there really wasn't too many people around taking photos in the water. So I couldn't, I couldn't even search it up. I couldn't even look, you know, and look online and say, oh, here's a workshop or here's a YouTube video or here's some yeah. tutorials. It was literally, I was learning um, t- traditional landscape photography and kind okay. of tra- taking what I've learned from that into the water. And then it all changes because light, how it behaves with water is completely, yeah. completely different. And um, fast forward now, I now have the ability to give back and, um, prior to my conversation with you, I don't have children. So being able to give back and help people and teach them um, yeah. to maybe create something of, that they want to create, that satisfies me to no end. Like that's, that's my goal um, currently. And not only to make images and share them, but to see other people so make their own images. You know, yeah. It's pretty rewarding when you, when, you, when you can teach that. And I, I, I sort of, I learned by trial and error. So yeah. when it comes to, um, you know, seeing the elation on the, of someone's face when they look at the photo in the back of the camera and go, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. And I say, well, you did that. You know, that's 100%. crazy. So now we have um, platforms where we will invite people to different parts of Australia. Yep. And then over, you know, we'll branch out over to overseas. And um, so far it's been, yeah, really well received. And um, yeah, so prior to COVID, we um, we'd booked out a bunch of workshops along the coast okay. you know and there might be a dozen people come stay with us for a few days and we'll take them out of the ocean with their water housings and <coughs> and give them the opportunity to, to create something for themselves you that's know that's really rewarding super rewarding yeah, it's unreal and i think that um giving back is also part of your learning so you know of course. teaching people what you've learned over the years as, a, as an artist or whatever you do in life to give back to somebody and then they can take that on and create their own form of art that's I think that's all part of the process for me anyway. A hundred percent. Hey, you've got the big rig on the ground there. I do. I'll get yeah. you to pick it up. For the people that are watching this, you'll be able to see 
for those of you listening, um, Warren's been kind enough to bring along, I guess, the, the money maker, the thing that makes all that magic, or well, he makes the magic, but the thing that assists him on the journey. Absolutely. What do you got? This is a, so I, I've, um, I've been using Canon cameras for quite a while now, and um, I house them in this super sturdy tank-like machine. It's like, it's a, it's a, a water housing built specifically for digital SLRs, and it is a surf, hardcore surf uh, photography unit. So okay. it's not a traditional diving um, housing, which would take you down 20, 30 meters. Yeah. This is, this is rated for about the surface to about 10 meters. Okay. So it's kind of like almost indestructible. <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, it's a, yeah, it's... Um, I was surprised by how heavy it is. We were having a conversation about this when Warren first come through. About what, about five kilos, you said? Yeah, this is about five kilos, only because I, I use a telephoto lens, so this is a 70 to 200 mil zoom okay. lens in there. It's not trad- typically the, 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 the lens that you'd use out in the water or start making photos with, but I just I completely love this lens, and so I've now adapted most of my, my work okay. to this lens. This is, um, yeah, that's what makes it really heavy. And um, yeah, so Aquatech have been great over the years. I, I we sort of work with them to make kind of make something that's going to work for me and um this is the this is what i use to make the images it's also quite heavy like you're saying but it's also it's filled with like metal buckles and yeah and things like that so it's always it's you got know, great it's, longevity by the looks of it oh it's huge but being in the ocean when a wave comes through and you're looking through this gives you a different perspective like it's showing you right up in the guts yeah. of a wave uh, when that wave comes you literally got to move it away from your face otherwise yeah. this thing hits you uh, it'll open you up. Couple lost, couple lost <laughs> yeah, teeth, a couple of broken noses. I that's can imagine. Hundred percent. So yeah, no, this is my best friend. I've got a couple of these, and I um, uh, for different, you know, different lenses and dome ports and different, yeah. different things to um, you know, capture different. It's pretty incredible, um, isn't it? The, the gear that we have available these days. It's amazing. Um, it's crazy that you can like the the photos you can take with a phone now, is unbelievable. So let alone like, a rig like that. That's, that's come, that's come a ways over the last couple of years. So. Um, this company also makes housings for the iPhones, and I, and I literally sometimes put this down because I, I'm happy just to go out with this little, there's yeah. little water housing that captures slow mo video, and I can actually see, show different like videos of what yeah. I do instead of than just. I tell you what, if Zach, cool. if Zachy bids, hundred percent. If Zachy bids is listening to this, mate, he's a hundred percent going by that bloke. <laughs> is a fiend for a morning sunrise photo. Yep. yep. So every morning we're out, we're chasing the sunrise for a walk and a coffee. There's the invite, and, mate. There's yeah, the invite. He's always... <laughs> we always say, like, I actually caught a video of him the other day. I don't know if you've seen it on my IG story. Sitting there with a couple of mates from Active Boys having a coffee after a swim. And the sun was rising. It was beautiful. And I just I started filming to stir him up. And I go, oh, it's not even that nice. And he goes, are you serious? Are you serious? He got real G'd up. But <laughs> no, we love it, man. We love it down there at the beach. And I'll, I'll definitely take you up on that. That's an awesome attitude. Yeah, I'd for love sure. to. Um, I'd love to come out there and, and catch a few shots and then see how it all works. Cool. I'll well, have to get into the water and maybe get a few shots for the. Uh, mate, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. That'd be sure. amazing. Hey, before we finish up, we've been we're literally going for nearly an hour and ten now, cool. um, which feels like five minutes. Um, but I want to know what's next for Warren Keelan. Is there anything on the horizon that you feel like you're yet to conquer, or you feel like you'd like to test yourself within? Yep. Absolutely, and as you know, touching on before, I'm I'm always I'm always satisfied with the experiences that I have, but I always want more. And one of those, there's there's probably a few in kind of that bucket list thing. Yeah. Um, I'd love to get over to Hawaii again as a photographer, um, okay. photograph some of the waves and the breaks over there. Um, Beautiful spot. Yeah, you know, photographically, it's 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 just it's just incredible. Uh, Tahiti. You know, yeah. it's got some of the biggest waves over there Chopu. and Chopu and um, just those really high volcanic you know, mountains where it sort of yeah. reaches the sea. Uh, there are a few other animals I'd like to photograph, not necessarily in the water, but on land, you know. Um, what are they? More sharks, you know, orcas, um, yeah. manta rays, um, New Zealand even. Just go up and down. I'd like to, I'd like to take yeah. a month off and just go and explore the coast of New Zealand. Uh, and photograph some of the you know the yeah, rivers and streams incredible. and waterfalls and ice caps and get in a chopper and do a few you know aerial trips yeah. over there. Uh, there's always something 
that I want to do. One of the things I really want to do prior to this all shutting down was um, to get over to the Ningaloo Reef over in Western Australia okay. and photograph whale sharks, you know, and catch up with yeah. a few photographic mates over there that have been that work there and live there yeah. and experience these things every day and they never tire of it. Yeah. And it, of course. And that, 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 oh, that joy just comes through in their photographs. Yeah. Manta rays jumping out of the water and giant humpback whales and tiger sharks. 100%. And, and things like that. So to put myself in, you know, that environment, it's always been on the go-to list. But it, it's, you know, you've got a, it's, it's a bit of a trek from here to Perth, and then you've got to go all the way up to Exmouth. It's, yeah, it's quite okay. the trek. Um, and no, I'll get there. Also, too, there's a couple of really nice waves and big slabs that I want to, that I want to see, yeah. let alone photograph as well. Yep. You know, some famous breaks around Australia and, and overseas. But what are those breaks like? Ship sterns. Yeah, I mean, like all those kind of things as an ocean and wave photographer, because um, I do shoot a lot of waves. That's part of my yep. thing as well as abstracts and waves. And um, to be able to f- just see something like that where they're swimming out would be amazing. But to be in a boat or a jet ski and just watch that oh, that yeah. happen, you know, the ride. You wouldn't want to get too close and, to that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all it's all sort of, you know, you, you, you're pretty safe in some places. In certain spots, yeah. But there are some photographers that just go above and beyond, like way out of my reach, like they're just... Russell Lord, who I was speaking about yeah. before, you know, his um, his photography is just it speaks for itself. To him to jump off a jet ski over in WA and swim over to these waves that yeah. are you know fifteen foot, and they just in, they just engulf surfers as they go over. Yeah, and he's in the water with a helmet on, just shooting a fisheye lens, which is a wide angle lens or sixteen to thirty five, and to make images from that, let alone crazy, you know, it's it's. Um, there are lots of sharks over there as well so you don't know what's under the water (laughs) so those kind of things yeah they do fascinate me i know my own limits and that's one thing with photography as well ocean photography is you know push yourself as much as you can but kind of be smart you've got to be smart about it too yeah Yeah. there's always something little voice in your head that says oh no that's a bit dangerous yeah calculate it you know look at it and go okay is it really or is it worth it and yeah um yeah, you, you'll make your mind up in those situations. That's why I want to get you out maybe in the ocean and 100%. give you a camera and see what that. you can create. I'd love that. That'd, That'd be, be pretty awesome. cool. That'd be awesome. So, I, man, I, I honestly, oh, I feel blessed to live where we do, to be able to experience it every day. So that'd be definitely something I'm going to hold you to. <laughs> We've got a great vista, haven't we? We're pretty lucky we to have We're a very lucky. sort of like I compare it to the, um, the Bondi area yep. of Sydney. And ours is like a very um, less populated, con- less congested with an amazing hidden community part of the world there yeah so it's so, uh, super lucky to live you know a couple of hundred meters from that definitely hey if you've been listening to this and you love it um you can go follow warren at it's just warren keelan isn't it that's right on social yeah so nice and easy for you you see we've got some little images um just there at the front which this man is actually gifted he's i tell you what for the future guests this guy is bloody up the stakes he's brought me a <laughs> coffee he bought me a couple of gifts so you know Think about it if you're coming on the experience in the future. <laughs> but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, mate, this has been a really nice chat. You're one guy that, as soon as I said you were coming on the potty, I was overwhelmed by the messages and the, and the conversations in person with people who have encountered you at some point in time throughout their lives in Wollongong here or over social, who not a single person had something bad to say about the human being that you are or your art. And I think that speaks, um, more importantly, the human being that you are. It speaks volumes for you and the way that you conduct yourself. So I congratulate you on that. And I thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Cheers, bro. And I hope that this is a moment you can look back on and and be excited about in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, mate. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, talk story with you. I appreciate it. And it's always good to chinwag over a coffee. So it's your shout next. Yeah, 100%, man. I appreciate it.